I'm excited that we've now arrived at this year's Class Day Address, which will be presented by artist and author Jenny Odell. Dean Whiting will now join us again to introduce Jenny. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Rahul, and a huge congratulations again to all our graduates who received awards today. And as Rahul indicated, I indeed now have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our 2020 GSD commencement speaker, Jenny O'Dell, who's an artist and a writer. O'Dell's bio on the website of Stanford's Art and Art History Department, where she teaches, describes her as making, quote, work at the intersection of research and aesthetics. One of my favorite of her projects is Satellite Landscapes, which researches the massive infrastructures of our transportation, waste, manufacturing, and power landscapes. Using carefully composed collections of satellite images, sketches, handwritten texts, and photographs, Odell traces connections from the scale of a light switch on the wall to a massive power plant on a city's edge. A project like Satellite Landscapes resonates with every one of our degree programs here at the GSD. Jenny came to my attention, a term I use quite deliberately, last summer with the publication of her book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, which has a beautiful bouquet of a cover and a lovely dedication to her students. I referenced How to Do Nothing in that same all school address last August in Sanders, and so we come full circle in having her here with us today. Her book looks at the contemporary context of hyper efficiency, our guilt over, quote, wasted time, and the technologies that have captured but not cultivated our attention. Pay attention. Even that expression implies an economic obligation, so let's say instead, absorb, look carefully. And in addition to looking, always remember that the worlds that we design affect our senses, our relations, our histories, and our futures. Odell's answer to reclaiming attention is place, and more specifically, a focus on the natural world. Your own answers to reclaiming attention may be different, but I asked you all last August to try. And just because you're graduating, don't you dare ever stop reclaiming your attention. And now, let us all give our attention to artist, author, and GSD 2020 commencement speaker, Jenny O'Dell. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you from my apartment in Oakland, California, um, although I have virtually placed myself in the Rose Garden nearby. Um, and first off, I just want to congratulate all of you, um, the students, on this immense achievement and to say sorry that I can't be there to celebrate with you in person. Um, also to just wish you well in whatever circumstances you may find yourself in. Um, I also wanna thank the Harvard Graduate School of Design for inviting me to speak. Um, it's such a pleasure and an honor. Um, I also know that many of you must be facing uncertainty far greater than uh, that which is usual when graduating. Um, I myself finished undergrad in 2008, which meant that I graduated directly into the recession. And I remember the way that that compounded what was already a loss of bearings as I entered a very different stage of my life. About 10 years after that, along an unpredictable and circuitous route that I hesitate to call my career, I wrote a book called How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. And the book is about rethinking what productivity means, about learning where and when you are, and about the importance of moving one's attention with will. So I've been asked to speak to you with that book in mind. Um, and so for the last few weeks, I've thought back to what points in the book might be useful to you in this strange moment. I've also thought about these things in the context of design. At Stanford, where I've worked for the last six years, I teach design to undergrads coming largely from outside of the arts and humanities in general. And I myself do not have a straightforward backward, uh, background in design. So my perspective on what design is and can do has always been a little bit of an outsider's view. With this in mind and considering this moment that we're in, I want to take this time to propose to you two ways of thinking about design that are different from design as making. And those ways are design as a form of sense making and design as response. So first I wanna come back to that word career. Um, as a verb to career means to move at full speed. It's etymologically related to the word car. 
And yet, in my experience, many people who feel fulfilled in what they do would not see their trajectory that way. Um, certainly, I would not. What I have done and what I enjoy doing feels closer to a walk that starts and stops, one with no destination, where I often got lost or waylaid by something interesting. Sometimes I went in circles or walked in a labyrinth or climbed to the top of a hill. Sometimes I walked backward or with my eyes closed. And many times I stopped walking. I did nothing. Given what you all have been doing and studying, I'm sure you're familiar with this phenomenon within the act of making. I sometimes refer to it as the dark matter of the artistic process, the part that doesn't look like anything. It could be the accidental day off, the seemingly unrelated and unplanned conversation with a friend, the movie or event that you got dragged to. If you're me, it could be long stretches of time in which you feel unable to make anything, or at least anything good. I am a meticulous journaler, and there are years where I see myself complaining that I haven't done anything, haven't made anything, but I'm so clearly doing the bulk of the thinking that would later show up in how to do nothing. I bring this up because we're living in a moment of unprecedented urgency and not doing anything that looks like something, writing, designing, making, can, bring, uh, can easily bring up feelings of guilt and anxiety. I've experienced a small version of this during the pandemic when a handful of outlets contacted me asking me for advice on how to do nothing in the pandemic. And my answer was usually no. My reasoning was that I had nothing to say. It was true. In an interview I did around that time with the artist and filmmaker Miranda July, she said that talking about the present was like being asked to describe falling while you are falling. In my case, I wanted to wait until I landed. My saying no was a small but firm insistence on my need for time and reflection. For someone in a creative field, it can almost be hard to believe that you continue to exist when you're not publicly producing or saying anything, but you do. I often ask myself, why is it so hard to hang back like this, even when it is so clearly something you need? Part of the reason is that the hustle is real, particularly now when so many are falling through our excuse for a social safety net. I think of something Oliver Berkman wrote in an article called Why Time Management is Ruining Our Lives. He says, quote, in an era of insecure employment, we must constantly demonstrate our usefulness through frenetic doing. Or as I put it in How to Do Nothing, in a situation where all time is money, time is an economic resource that we can no longer justify spending on nothing. It provides no return on investment. It is simply too expensive. In this context, it's important to note that I'm at a place right now where I can afford to say no. I still have a full-time adjunct teaching job that, unlike many adjunct teaching jobs, pays my bills. And that, of course, is on top of a lifetime of countless other privileges. But even in this ideal situation, refusal feels expensive. And this gets at the second part of the difficulty, which I think is embedded more deeply in our psyches. It's also where I come to that first sense of design. Design is sense-making. In How to Do Nothing, I draw on the work of musician and composer Pauline Oliveros, who developed a practice she referred to as deep listening. For her, deep listening was, quote, listening in every possible way to everything possible to hear, no matter what you are doing. Such intense listening includes the sounds of daily life, of nature, of one's own thoughts, as well as musical sounds. Oliveros incorporated this into her performances. For example, the 1989 album, Deep Listening, in which she and other musicians wielding their voices, an accordion, trombone, didgeridoo, and electronics improvised in constant response to each other and their echoes. They did this in an underground cistern with a two million gallon capacity and a 45 second reverberation time. Oliveros wrote, the cistern space in effect is an instrument being played simultaneously by all three composers. The album, which is amazing, by the way, highly recommend, um, is a stunning example of how there is nothing passive about the act of listening. Indeed, listening and playing are inseparable in this performance, an ongoing response of players to other players and to the cistern. To listen is to stay awake and alive to the world as it is. And what I want to emphasize here is the reason that Oliveros gave for the importance of something like deep listening, which is something you have to practice. The reason was that we're taught to do the exact opposite of deep listening. Oliveros said, 
In general, our cultural training dominantly promotes active manipulation of the external environment through analysis and judgment, and tends to devalue the receptive mode, which consists of observation and intuition. And this is something that once you start to pay attention to it, you will begin to notice everywhere, especially now. There's this leaning forward, grasping quality to everything, where the option to just observe without judgment never even presents itself. It's not just that we are constantly presented with information, but that it's expected that you have a take even as you're consuming it. Over and over each day, we ask ourselves, is it good or is it bad? Is this person on my side? What's my take? What's the immediate solution? More and more of this, faster and faster, and never the question, do I need to have a take? Do I need more time to think about this? Is this maybe more complicated? What led up to this? Not being given the time to ask these questions easily leads to a kind of myopia, where we can only react to what is in front of us instead of taking the longer or just a different view. This matters for everything, but I think it especially matters for sense making. For me, design is so often an argument about how to see the world, about what to pay attention to and in what order. It is a practice of perspective and scope, and therefore it requires the ability to step outside of every habitual way of seeing. One of the most generous and humane definitions of what it means to be a designer that I've encountered comes from Sarah Hendren, author of the forthcoming book, What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World. In 2016, she gave a talk at IO, which is the same conference I originally gave the talk called How to Do Nothing. And in her talk, which was called Design for Know Nothings, Dilettantes, and Melancholy Interlopers, she speculates on a series of other words and phrases for designer. And one of them is orchestrator of attention. I've come back to that phrase ever since, orchestrator of attention. Compared to a solutionist or product-oriented version of design, orchestrating attention may look like nothing at all. But I would argue that it is the most substantive work you can do. In How to Do Nothing, one of the questions I ask is about the definition of productivity. I ask, productive of what, for whom, and why? For example, how can a company that ever more efficiently figures out how to monetize attention for financial gain, economically entrap the vulnerable, or extract more resources from the earth, be considered productive in even the narrowest sense of the word? And on the other hand, what could be more productive than giving someone more access to their own experience to a world that is richer and makes more sense, and therefore a world in which that person has agency. As someone whose perception of my surroundings has been fundamentally altered by artists like Pauline Oliveros and Sarah Hendren, I am always astounded by how truly generative this work is. When someone orchestrates your attention, it literally produces the presence of things in your world that were not there before. So now I am going to share my screen. Um, so in the book, a lot of my examples of this process come from bird watching. And if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I am very much a bird person. But today I want to give you a different example. The rose garden that I mentioned in the book um, is closed, uh, the rose garden that's behind me. And during quarantine, I found myself instead walking uphill from my apartment. At some point, the hill itself and all of the hills around here came to the foreground of my attention. I started reading a local geology blog, lovingly kept up by a local geologist for more than 15 years, as well as a book called Geology of the San Francisco Bay Area, and slowly over weeks of walking, reading, and zooming in and out on Google Earth, I learned where I live, in a canyon carved by a creek that runs under the street just down the block from my apartment. I learned that a new housing subdivision set improbably into the side of a hill is a former quarry of metavolcanic rock, and that in some of the parks here, you will find the shells of ancient marine animals from when this land was seafloor. Most of all, when I look at that same outline of the hills that I have almost every day in the four years that I have lived in Oakland, there's some kind of explanation for what I'm seeing. It is not just random lumps and angles. It's reminded me of the progression from looking to recognizing and how the framing of attention puts new things in our world. 
Last week, I went on a hike alone in an open space preserve that I have been to many times. The main trail follows a creek through a canyon that rises steeply on both sides. After years of paying attention to birds and plants, I was able to pick out individual strains in the collective bird song, robins, song sparrows, and warblers migrating from Mexico. And I could name some of the plants as I passed them, thimbleberry, California buckeye, green spot nightshade. But there was something very different about this visit. When I took a trail up away from the creek and sat at a bench on one side of the canyon facing the other, I thought about something I had just read on the Oakland geology blog. The creek ran along a geological fault, meaning that the rock types on either side are different. It also meant that the hill that I was looking at might be moving faster in a northward direction than the hill I was sitting on. Then on my way back to the creek, I started noticing all of the rocks, pebbles, boulders, exposed rock faces. I started using my binoculars, which I had originally brought to look at birds, to inspect faraway rocky outcrops. I found I had the same question about rocks that I'd had years, years ago about birds. Did I just not notice these before? What did I think they were? Just rocks? As if they were just somehow there, rather than the outcome of very real and specific phenomena that happened millennia before I came along to walk on them? Paying attention to rocks and thinking about a time frame outside not only my own lifetime, but outside of human temporality, ironically made me feel more at home in the world, or at least it helped me make sense of it. Over the course of my life, every new lens has added to this feeling that the world is not some arbitrary given thing, nor am I some anonymous and unrelated entity dropped into it. There is continuity between the rocks existence and mine. I am also humbly reminded of how much work how much time and patience goes into even just beginning to grasp the complexity that surrounds me. In quarantine, an experience which, in which all time threatens to collapse into the same meaningless day, I have turned frequently to these other temporalities. When I wasn't thinking about the prehistoric collisions that made the hills I look at, I was looking at webcams showing eagles nesting in Iowa or peregrine falcons nesting in the UC Berkeley Tower where the babies became the size of their parents in a matter of weeks, or almost the same. They're not full size yet. Um, but I, I put a camera on a tripod and pointed it out my bedroom window, taking the same photo several times a day for months, recording the changes in light and the passing of clouds and rain. And I also read Philip Dre's book, There is Power in a Union a labor history of the US that begins in the 18th century and which helped me put so many of the current conversations about labor and individual risk into a broader perspective. What's important to note is that these temporalities are neither unrelated nor irreconcilable. Struggles play out and beings are born and die and clouds form and dissipate on this same rock whose pieces are still moving. As we speak, I am moving slowly, imperceptibly in a Northwest direction. I believe that we individually have the ability to direct our attention. For example, to see in multiple time frames at once, or at the very least outside of the default temporality of everyday life. But I also believe that we need help doing this. And that's why for me, the role of the artist and designer is that, uh, that is most important right now is as an orchestrator of attention. Someone who can create the lenses with which we can see a completely different reality. Not one that is imaginary or fabricated, but has in fact been there all along. Of course, doing this requires close attention on the orchestrator's part as well, which is what brings me to the second idea I mentioned of design as response. Not to the world as you want it to be or expect it to be, but a response to the world as it really is right now in all of the detail that unfolds if you just give yourself time to see it. One of my favorite uh, practitioners of this mindset is the Japanese farmer Masanobu Fukuoka. He is known for perfecting a system in the 1970s that he called do nothing farming. Flouting the established protocols for traditional rice farming, he devised a way of farming that used far fewer inputs and less labor. Instead of flooding fields and sowing rice in the spring, he scattered seeds directly on the ground in the fall as they would have fallen naturally. In place of conventional fertilizer, he grew a cover of green clover and then threw the leftover stalks back on top when he was done. In the end, 
Fukuoka's farm was more productive than neighboring farms, and it also rehabilitated the soil instead of depleting it, as so many farms do over time. The system was even capable of creating farmable soil on inhospitable strips of land. And what I want to stress here is time. It took Fukuoka decades of observation and failed experiments to arrive at the system. Rather than imposing an abstract will on a compliant piece of land, what he was doing was more akin to patient collaboration. As you can imagine, for someone who finally figured out how to do more by doing less, Fukuoka had a great sense of humor. In his book, The One Straw Revolution, he wrote, because the world is moving with such furious energy in the opposite direction, it may appear that I have fallen behind the times. And that which was viewed as primitive and backward is now unexpectedly seen to be far ahead of modern science. This may seem strange at first, but I do not find it strange at all. In that book, One Straw Revolution, Fukuoka talks about an experience he had as a young man when he was studying plant pathology under a brilliant researcher. He essentially overworked himself to the point of hospitalization. And when he was discharged, he wandered to a hill overlooking the local harbor, falling asleep underneath a tree. When he woke up in the early morning, he was shocked into awareness by the flight of a night heron, incidentally, one of my favorite birds and the official bird of Oakland. Um, he wrote, everything I had held in firm conviction, everything upon which I had ordinarily relied was swept away with the wind. I felt that I understood just one thing. Without my thinking about them, words came from my mouth. In this world, there is nothing at all. I felt that I understood nothing. It's easy to read despair into that phrase, understood nothing. But what Fukuoka is describing is a moment of exhilaration, the underpinnings of the humility that eventually led to do-nothing farming. To understand nothing is to see everything, to have an empty enough mind to observe what is actually there. After all, it was humility with respect to the land and its inhabitants that allowed Fukuoka to design a successful system, one that made use of and did justice to the already present intelligence in the ecosystem. To come back to Pauline Oliveros, you could say that he was practicing a form of deep listening. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, when I was in high school, I often went to live figure drawing classes at the local community art center. And I often had difficulty with parts of the body that I had a lot of presumptions about, like faces and hands. But eventually I stumbled upon a trick where instead of trying to draw the outline of the body, I would draw the outline of the negative space around it. Though I couldn't have articulated it at the time, what this method did was improve the quality of my looking. I would never be able to get away from my preconceptions about what an arm or a leg looks like, but the shape formed by its negative space would always be unfamiliar to me, and therefore I would be forced to look more closely. Um, I think I know what an arm looks like, but I don't know what this arm looks like from this angle at this exact moment under this light. And again, this is tied to humility. In this case, the idea that I don't actually know what I'm looking at, that I know nothing about it, that I am starting from zero. And thanks to my mom for saving these. Hi, mom, if you're watching. Um, this idea of starting from zero came to mind recently when I was having a conversation with a former student who was about to graduate. She was asking me for advice and I was having a hard time summoning, summoning any because it's currently so difficult to imagine the future. I found myself telling her to look for the affordances of the moment. By that, I meant to give herself time to actually observe this moment in all of its detail. In essence, to draw lines around the negative space and in so doing, see the possibilities that might otherwise be obscured. On all sides, she, you, and I are surrounded by established pathways, established disciplines, established ways of making and looking at things. We are also hemmed in by the sense of urgency I mentioned earlier and a future that may feel foreclosed, whether it's by the pandemic, climate change, or something else. In my experience, especially right now, the world will not provide you with an invitation to start from zero, to drop your armor and your assumptions and try to see it all as if for the first time. You have to provide that opportunity to yourself. But trust me that in any given moment, it is more possible than you think. You can even come to a point where you can create that opportunity for others. To see spaces differently is already to imagine different ways of moving through them. To see things differently is to imagine new uses for them. In the talk I mentioned earlier, Sarah Hendren details the many design solutions of Cindy, a disabled woman who qualifies for a robotic arm. 
While the arm is considered state-of-the-art design, it doesn't allow her to do things that she wants to do, like sign her name or eat with a fork. Using household items and materials like wax and zip ties, Cindy creates solutions that, while they may not look as designy as the robotic arm, Hendren takes seriously as design. They are real responses to the present situation using what is available. And in her use of them, Cindy completely recasts not only the object's use, but their significance. Her ability to do this stems from her intimate familiarity with her own disability and her specific knowledge of her everyday experience, something the designers of the robotic arm can never know as well as she does. I have thought of these designs frequently during the pandemic when we see so many things used as other things. A t-shirt becomes a mask, an empty school building becomes a test center, a Google doc becomes the basis for mutual aid. Of course, these things do not negate the ways in which the government has mishandled the pandemic, but they are examples of close attention and response to the present with whatever is at hand. This attention to the present can extend out into an entire attitude, an entire orientation towards this historical moment. When I suggest that we accept the present, I am not suggesting that we acquiesce to its injustices. I mean that we accept the brokenness of the world as a starting point and that we fight for and in this same world rather than an abstract, idealized one. Thomas Merton, another person I talk about in How to Do Nothing, embodied this way of thinking. Merton was a 20th century monk who lived as a hermit at a Trappist monastery in rural Kentucky. In 1848, he wrote, in 1948, he wrote an autobiography called The Seven Story Mountain, which his friend described as, quote, the evocation of a young man in an age when the soul of mankind had been laid open as never before. During world depression and unrest and the rise of both communism and fascism, when Europe and America seemed destined to war on a brutal and unimaginable scale. The sentiment was relatable. The book sold millions of copies. But years later, Merton wrote to that same friend that he'd had a change of heart. He'd accompanied a clergyman on a trip to Louisville and had been standing on a street corner. Oh, getting a chat. Um, okay. Uh, he'd been standing on a street corner when he'd become overwhelmed with love for the strangers that surrounded him. He described it as waking from a dream of separateness. He was here in the same world with them. And it's been commemorated on the street corner. Um, later in a book called Contemplation in a World of Action, he wrote some lines that have come back to me every day during this pandemic. If I had no choice about the age in which I was to live, I nevertheless have a choice about the attitude I take and about the way and the extent of my participation in its living ongoing events. To choose the world is an acceptance of a task and a vocation in the world, in history and in time, in my time, which is the present. I like to think about what kind of design might proceed from this kind of attitude. Design that seeks not necessarily to construct, abstract, or replace, but design that responds to the present with the tools of the present. Design that accepts the existence of the world as it is in all of its beautiful and terrible detail. Design that lives in the flawed world with strangers like Merton on the street corner. Design that doesn't build solutions from scratch, but locates and maps the possibilities inherent in the very fabric of the present. I personally believe that it's only after I have spent some time observing, drawing that negative space, listening for what and who is present, then maybe I have earned the right to ask, what is here that needs supporting? From that point, I can insert myself into the flow of things, aspiring to the careful attention of Pauline Oliveros or the subtle attunement of Fukuoka. For example, how might we orchestrate attention toward the workers who maintain the experiences of everyday life that many have taken for granted? How could we organize existing ideas and work that has already been done along new lines? How can we design or simply connect new coalitions in order to respond to the economic and environmental injustices of this moment? Or what happens when we think about design less as making than as a form of unmaking? At the end of How to Do Nothing, I put forth something I call manifest dismantling, which I imagine is the opposite of the 19th century doctrine of manifest destiny. I described manifest dismantling as a form of purpose bound up with remediation, something that requires us to give up the idea that progress can only face forward blindly. As a child of Silicon Valley, I am all too familiar with the way the word innovation is usually tied to the idea of materially putting something new in the world rather than restoring something or putting it back in its rightful place. 
The example I give in the book is of a recent dam removal that took just as much design, engineering, and innovation as its original construction, if not more. So I also want to ask, what would design look like that aligns not with the logic of profit and production, but instead the logic of repair, reparations, and responsibility? Can someone working in design be more of a steward and a gardener than a straightforward producer? This doesn't just require sustained attention. It also requires major shifts in our ideas of artistic ego, productivity, and the definition of creativity. But these are just the sorts of shifts that the moment requires and in fact is teaching us as we become more and more aware of our mutual reliance and the ways our actions affect others. As George Packer recently wrote in The Atlantic, the moment teaches us that the alternative to solidarity is death. Everything I've talked about so far Design is sense-making, design is response, accepting the world as it is, finding out what needs to be restored. These all have one really big thing in common, and it's patience. So that's the first of three concrete pieces of advice I have to give you. Be patient. Learning to inhabit different temporalities and scales of attention will help you do this, but it will always be difficult. In quarantine, as possibly many of you have, I have been thinking a lot about the meaning of patience and how different it feels from almost anything else. I also came across an incredibly resonant description of this quote, um, of this in a quote, often attributed to Viktor Frankl, but whose author is apparently actually unknown. Um, and they said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So let's stop sharing. Um, okay. So I have been keeping that last quote close at hand. Already social media, advertising, and life in general are designed to eliminate the space between stimulus and response. And then on top of that, we're living in the midst of a disaster whose details seem to shift day to day, hour to hour. Practicing patience right now will make you feel guilty, or at the very least, it will feel unnatural, but it is essential. Remember that this moment demands not your knee-jerk reaction, your guilt, nor your anxiety, but your ingenuity. And that will only grow with time inside that space of possibility. Pry it open if you have to. That break in the cycle of reactions is the gap through which you can see other perspectives, temporalities, and value systems. You will need time to adjust your eyes. Give yourself that time and trust that it is necessary. The second piece of advice, and this comes very much from experience, is to drop the idea of getting it exactly right every time or ever. Over the last few years, I have really begun to appreciate the fact that we are changing in a world that is also changing. In my opinion, perfectionism attends an unrealistic view of the ego as a static defensible thing that makes other static defensible things, when from what I can tell, that simply isn't the way things work. Remember that even the rocks are moving. You are just one piece of the puzzle, and each thing you make has a long line of unmade things in front of it. It's enough, it's actually more than enough, for you to be in the world, responding to it over and over again, moment to moment, from a place of deep attention and love. Perfectionism is also related to the idea of the personal brand, which I argue against in How to Do Nothing. I describe the thematic tightening of my Discover Weekly playlist on Spotify, where I wrote, at its most successful, an algorithmic honing in would seem to incrementally entomb me as an ever more stable image of what I like and why. This kind of design casts itself as an identifiable, bounded unit that is also easier to appropriate and advertise to. And I contrasted this with listening to local radio stations, specifically to being surprised by a song I like for reasons I can't actually explain. I wrote that when this happens, I sometimes feel like something I don't know is talking to something else I don't know through me. And when I apply this perspective to the act of making, I think about all the times I almost didn't try something because a preemptive perfectionism convinced me that I wouldn't get it right or that I wasn't a perfect expert in that subject. In the end, thankfully, curiosity got the better of me and made me step outside what I thought were my own boundaries. I surprised myself. I wasn't who I thought I was. And that brings me to my last piece of advice, which is whatever it is that you're doing, don't try to do it alone. Even if you're like me, 
and you have what looks like a highly solitary process, appreciate how much of your thinking happens in conversations with others, in encounters with unexpected ideas and situations. You can't control that kind of stuff, and you shouldn't want to. There are infinite possibilities between you and other people, especially the ones you wouldn't expect. And here I'm also including artists and thinkers from the past. Sure, I have an identifiable sensibility and I'm always going to have a Jenny style take on things, i.e. birds and rocks will always somehow be involved, but I have no idea what will come from future encounters. And that not only gives me a reason to pay close attention all the time, it gives me a reason to get up in the morning because you never know what you'll see or where it will lead. It also means that it's possible to make something larger, much larger than yourself. The publishing of How to Do Nothing, which is itself a tissue of references and ideas I had encountered over my lifetime, put me in touch with so many people working in art, ecology, tech organizing, and other fields, people who might not have come together by other means. When I think about what it is that I actually made, it's not this frozen physical object with pages. It's the new constellation that formed as a result one that is still moving forward and shifting and changing how I think about everything. For many of us, the pandemic has been an isolating experience, but I think it's also an opportunity to think about how to build those connections with intention. After all, they're not going to form themselves. It's something you have to build. Believe me, if I could go back and change one thing, it would be this. I would have realized earlier the importance of asking questions of everyone, listening closely and finding traction within the work that's already being done. That's my advice. Um, but really, if you take anything away from this address, I hope that it's the ability to give yourself permission. Permission to be patient, to listen without yet needing to speak, to observe without needing to know, permission to not make anything at all for a while, permission to dwell in that space between stimulus and response, to take time to really see what's there, even while everything rages around you. And also permission to feel joy, even in the midst of all this, at the surprises that inevitably come with sustained attention and familiar, unfamiliar perspectives. Everything is, was, and will be touch and go. The world is our two million gallon underground cistern with a 45 second reverberation time, and we are playing it together right now. So thank you, and again, congratulations to all of you. You have so much to be proud of. Stay safe, keep breathing, and I am wishing you all the best. <laughs>